Hi, I'm on the New Holland stand here with Nigel Honeyman. Now, Nigel, you are the product specialist for harvesting products, hay products at New Holland. Yes, sir. And uh, can you just tell us a little bit about what your role is at New Holland and then a little bit about the machine behind us? Well, primarily my role as a product specialist is uh, looking after the machines. Everyone's looking at this CR11 and saying this is a wonderful global machine. However, every one of these machines is tailored for the specific market that they're going to. So a German unit will be slightly different to a UK unit, to a French unit. Because of legislation, Germany can't go wide. We can go a little bit wider than Germany. But other things on the combine itself uh, that we would have in the UK that the Germans wouldn't have. Okay, so on that, behind us, CR11, your new combine. Yes. This is the largest combine New Holland ever built, is that right? Yes, it is. It's probably yeah. probably the most expensive project that we've ever undertaken. Really interesting. So, so this, this machine, you were, we were sort of talking earlier, and you're saying this machine is, is ground up. How, what percentage of this machine is, is new, ground up new? 95% uh, of the parts on this machine uh, have been created specifically for this machine. Right, okay. So let's just, just as a, an overall beginning, just go through some of the facts and figures of this machine, just in terms of sizes, capacities, what, what makes this machine, CR11, it's your, say your biggest machine, what makes it different to all of the other combines in your range? Okay, so what we've done with this machine, we're looking at what we call the pillars. What we're trying to do is drive down the overall cost of harvesting. And one of the key things here is looking at capacity. What we want with this machine is to be able to get the lowest cost per tonne, per acre, per hectare, however people are looking at that. Now that might sound a little bit bizarre, bearing in mind that this may very well be the most expensive machine ever to, to wear the New Holland badge. So what we've done, we've taken the rotor unit itself, we've got it as wide as we can at 24 inches. One limitation that we've always got is that we can't exceed the envelope size. If we go as wide as we possibly could, they couldn't get it on the roads in Germany. So we're stuck at this three and a half metre limit and four metre tall. And within those figures, we have to do all the magic. So what we've done, we've put two 24 inch rotors in the machine, slightly longer as well, so that we've got a much greater area, both for threshing and for separation. What we've got at the front is a dynamic feed roll that feeds those two rotors. But what is new for this machine is the way that that is driven. Historically, it's been driven by a, by a belt drive line going down the side of the machine, but that takes up space. We can't go into that three and a half meters. So what we've done is we've taken that drive line and put it within the combine itself. We're using the left-hand rotor as the drive shaft. So that way we keep it within the chassis and still manage to drive the DFR synchronized in speed to the speed of the rotors. So thinking about the machine now, and we'll, we'll go and have a look around the side in a minute. So, you know, we, a lot of us have seen combines well aware of how they go together. Visually on the side of the machine, there's a lot less parts to see in terms of belts and drives. Yes. And that's because you've put the, the mechanical drive for the, the rotors through the body of the rotor itself. Yes. Okay, so obviously you're talking about twin rotor machine. Looking at our feed house to begin with, so yes. what changes are we seeing here for this size of machine in terms of, in terms of <laughs> Every, Toby, everything? Toby, everything. Okay, the, you, so can, head you, you can point at that and there is not one thing that carries head, over from head the Header capacities, so what sort of working width headers are we seeing on this? We are, we are testing at the moment a 60 foot Macdon header with this machine, so an 18 meter header. Right. Chances are we won't bring that into the United Kingdom or someone might have one, but typically we've been testing this machine in UK conditions with a, uh, with a 50 foot, 15 meter header. Right, and we spoke earlier about testing this machine in the UK. Yep. You've been running this machine in different parts of the UK, but you were yes. running it in Dorset. We were. Now, for, for many people, Dorset ne isn't necessarily the arable county of, of, of Britain. What's unique about that, 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 that what, part of the UK for very, very big combine testing? What was unique about that and the farm that we went to uh, was the crop, the range of crops that, that were being cut down there. Um, if we took this into conventional wheat, conventional barley, conventional rape, we would have learned anything about anything new about the machine. We've been testing this machine over eight years now, so we've, it's, been, it's done a lot of conditions. Um, but down there, it was looking at organic crops, it was looking at undersown uh, barley crops, undersown with grass, and with the harvest that we had this last year with the damp, uh, that was a challenge. So what we learned, we learned a great deal about the crop flow through the machine uh, and the way that it responded to those very, very harsh conditions that we were trying it on. And that is just coming down, as you say, that the, the unique conditions of that part of the UK is, is pushing this machine effectively to its limit or just to see where those limits are when you're developing this machine? We need to establish where the limits are. 
We've tested this machine this year. The one machine that was in the UK started in France in the dry conditions, came to us in the damp, and then went back down to Italy for, for corn, bean, maize, soya, and, and those sort of crops. So we're, we're, we're learning with this machine the whole time uh, as to what we can actually achieve with it, where the limits lie. Right, and this, this machine behind us is, is, is one of your engineering machines, and this is very, very close to a production machine, is that right? This is near enough what a production machine will be in right, terms okay. of specification. There's a couple of wires, a couple of sensors that are on this machine that won't be on a production machine, uh, but for, for all intents and purposes, the way the crop flows through the machine, the way the chopper works at the back, it is a production level machine. Now, we were, you were talking about working width and bits and pieces. Now, I've seen this machine before, or a version of this machine before, yes. at Agritechnica. Yep. Now, this one is on tracks. Yes, it Another is. Another unit I've seen Agritechnica was, was, was on wheels. And golden, which was yeah, and gold. a, bit, a bit of a shame it's not here. Yeah. Um, is track drive the only option for UK? Just I, th I think, going back to what I said about the fact that we, we tailor it to individual markets, I think the, we will be tracks only in the UK. Right. There are some markets that prefer wheels, uh, but for us in the UK it will come with tracks, two widths of tracks, slightly wider than currently on the 1090, so we'll start with a 26 inch belt or a 32 inch belt. But even with a 32 inch and, and belt. Is this your wider track on this one? No, or? this is the 26 inch belt. Okay, so you so will you offer what well, I wider. Okay, so one. thinking about when we're going through the machine, now we yeah. talked, you talked about it's a new engine layout. Yes. Now, we're not going to have a look at the engine as we talked about earlier, <laughs> but can you just talk us through how that engine drive looks yes. and why it's different from the, the CR1090 the CR that it effectively supersedes? What we've done is we've completely swapped the direction of the engine. So traditionally on any combine, the engine goes across the chassis. What we've done with this one is we've put it actually in line with the chassis. And then what we can do is we can make the drive line more efficient. The key with this machine is efficiency. That if we can save power by not wasting it by changing power directions before it gets to work, we can put that power into output. That's what we need to do. Everything about this machine is about efficiency and output. Uh, so we change the direction and then the we've actually inclined the engine as well. So the engine's inclined in roughly so the same... Not, so it's not, unlike conventional machines where we're thinking about the engine sitting flat on the rear deck, your engine is, is, is effectively it's, tipping, it's inclined. tipping forward to go down at the, so, at the angle of the rotors. And, and the idea being that we don't get any angular displacement of the drive shafts going into the rotors. Any angular displacement wastes power. So if we can get as straight as drive line as possible, we make it more efficient that we can use that power for output. So what engine is in, in, in this... What engine is in this machine? So in this machine, we've got our Fiat powertrain FBT Cursor 16 engine running at 775 horsepower. Now, something which I think a lot of people may be interested in, and I know this machine doesn't have it, but I'm just interested in your view. So this machine is a diesel machine. Yes. And it's using effectively hydraulic drives or belt drives throughout it or mechanical drives. We're mm -hmm. not seeing any electrical hybrids or we're nope. not seeing any alternative fuels. Yep. Is there an interest or a pressure with harvester manufacturers to address the fact that you know the rest of the sector is talking about alternative fuels there's a tractor here that runs on methane yes. is it something with with harvest technology that you're saying look very big combine we developed it for eight years it's got a diesel engine in it is there a vision perhaps longer term in new holland to say actually we need to look at alternative fuels in our yes. in our harvesting machines well we like to think of ourselves as one of the leaders in alternative fuels within agriculture we've invested heavily in, in compressed natural gas, now liquefied natural gas as well. And with our partner, with, with Fiat Powertrain, we have that technology to do, use it within the engines at the moment. What we're not seeing currently is the demand coming out of agriculture for it. You've got to remember that one of these harvesters is only being used for six weeks in a year, so investing heavily over the top of that is something that we're not seeing demand for at the moment, but we've got it in our back pocket because we've, de we've uh, developed it and delivered it so on yeah, the tractors so already. Your alternative fuel technology is effectively available, yes. but not something you're looking at now. Exactly Now, that. whilst we're at the front of the machine, now the cab, you're saying the cab is effectively the same as a, a CR1090, is that right? Similar, we've done a few changes within, um, looking at different, different seating, different controls. We're using different screens in the cab as well. We're using our, our new IntelliV 12, the 12 inch screen within the cab. Uh, and that is all new for, for this machine. And have you got, when we, you know, again, very, very common thing we're seeing in the sector, um, in terms of autonomy or, or yep. automation of machine setup or yep. uh, obviously GPS guidance is it's completely mm -hmm. standard. What levels of, of, of automatic adjustments and, and control are we seeing on this machine that is effectively new for the CR11? New, not so much. We've been developing this for, for many, many years now with the IntelliSense system. 
So all of these machines coming into the UK will have IntelliSensor standard. There's no, there's no two ways about it. That system can, op can work better than even some of the best operators out there. Continually adjusting the machine many thousands of times a second, checking to see whether it can make any improvement on it. And is that taking data from other machines that are working worldwide? So is that a telematic linked adjustment All, all of these machines are linked by telematics, but they don't use, the, the, the combine needs to be able to see the, the conditions exactly within the location that it's working. What is happening in France may not have any relevance on what you're doing in Dorset, in Lincoln, wherever, wherever it might be. So the machine has got to be able to pick up with the sensors that we put on the machine, the actual conditions that it's running at at the time, and use those conditions for making any variations to the combine. No, I know there was a few things on the side of the machine we want to walk around and have a look at. Yep. Do you want to go down and have a look now? And we'll Let's have a look. look. Let's have a look. One of the key areas um, that stops these machines being efficient is downtime. So what we've done here is we've made a very, very simple drive line. The drive line itself, we already talked about the rotor being used as a drive shaft, but you can see here we're very open into the side of the machine. We don't have a plethora of belts and chains uh, running around the machine. In fact, there are no drive chains on this combine whatsoever. They've all gone. There's only two chains on the combine, which is the elevator trace chain and the chain that's up inside the clean grain elevator. They're the only two that are there. Um, but you can see here, we're straight into the side of the machine. No, nothing, two clips on each of those white panels, and we're straight into the rotor unit and onto the cleaning shoe itself. Now, it's, now we sort of, as I say, we spoke about this earlier, with the cleaning, the cleaning system on it, there's a, there's a double cleaning system on this yes. machine, isn't there? Twin clean. And is that, is that unique to CR11? Yes, it is. And can you just take us through why you have the twin clean and why that's been developed for this? Is that a, you know, just go through, is that harvest capacity? Or is that, is that a function of one of the pillars you were talking about earlier on it's, harvest quality? It's, it, for, for several reasons we do it. Firstly, the twin clean system is there so that we get capacity. One of the, one of the killers when we start talking about combines, when we start talking about efficiency, is losses over the back. Losses over the back is the cost that you don't sign a cheque for, unless you have to put a graminicide over to, to cover all the losses that are, that are sprouting out the back of the machine. So what we've, what we've done here, We've used, since the mid-80s in the TF, we've used the self-leveling cleaning shoe. It was very easy to understand. You tip the combine over 10 degrees that way, you tip the cleaning shoe back 10 degrees and it's all level. We're now all about distribution. To get output out of this machine, what we've introduced is a sidewards shaking on the, on the, on the cleaning shoe, but it has what we call a closed loop logic. We don't say tip it 10 degrees that way and shake it that far. The combine itself, by looking at pressure sensors, halfway down the cleaning shoe behind the grain pan and right at the back, check to see what this level is on the shoe. So if it sees that, for whatever reason, it could be slope, but it may be that we're not feeding evenly at the front. If there's any uneven feed going into the front of the machine, what the front of the combine can see is, ah, I'm not level on the grain pan, I will shake this way. But the back of the combine might say, well, hang on, I'm tipping over this way so I can shake the other. And what we've seen in testing is the front can shake to the right and the back can shake to the left. Um, but what it does, it's all about distribution. And that's where we get the output from the machine. The self-leveling cleaning shoe on the current CR has done us fantastically well. But it took up an inordinate amount of space within the chassis to do that. We need that space for output. And that's why this new twin clean system has come so about. So you've touched upon output yeah. quite a lot through this. Oh, yes. Um, do you have any sort of figures that you can give us on terms of harvest capacity? Because that's something we... Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yes. we've been a bit cagey about le Leading what, question. Leading question. <laughs> um, so what we say about this machine, it's 20 to 40% beyond where we are currently with the 1090. And where are you currently with the 1090? It'll run 100 tonnes an hour is what it did with the world record that it still holds. Right, OK. So you've... You and for combine, combine understanders in the world, that's that's quite a considerable claim of output it is. It is. compared to others that may be painted other colours. It is. No one who has had anything to do with this machine and the development of this machine, or who's even driven the machine, and I know Toby, you're aware of a few people that have, um, are in any doubt uh, that this is head and shoulders beyond where we are currently with a 1090. So I, yeah, so that's quite. So I, I have spoken to some guys who's used, used this machine on test. Um, in your development process, and one of one of the feedbacks was the was the losses or yeah, the lack, lack of lack of losses. Yes. Can we just touch on how 
how that works, as you, you sort of said at the start with your pillars in terms of, yep. of that harvest quality, what are your losses looking like or your, your loss retention and, and how have you managed that? Is that part of your clean issue arrangement or is it more it's, holistic for the machine? It's more holistic. Uh, lo losses don't just come over the cleaning shoe, they come through the rotors and the separation system as well. So the expansion in size and dimensions of the rotors um, has given us the ability to cut the losses down. What we've seen in testing with this machine is sub 0.3% losses coming out the back and that's with a 50 foot table so what we've seen with a 12 inch by 12 inch 30 centimeter tray under the back what we've seen is so barely, you're, you're, barely 30 grains you're, yeah so you're talking about sub 0.3 sub 0.3 percent is what now, we've seen it wasn't that long ago when we talked about combine setups that less than one percent losses was acceptable less than one percent was what what we used to do when we yeah when we used to teach people on the cr 1090 and what have you and is that is that quite a, quite a substantial claim in terms of your lack of losses? Yep. Is that through the technology you've got that will set this machine up? Could an operator achieve that, or do you need to use that inbuilt sort of real-time adjustments to get that refined ability to thrash? A good operator can switch the system off here, and he will get better results than what he's achieved till, up till now. With the IntelliSense system, with all the monitoring that we've got going on with it, what we can get there is these, these super low figures that we've got. Technology works best when the operator doesn't perceive that it's happening. One thing we'll look at in a minute is the, is the chopper. When we asked the people, how did you get on with a new chopper? What they said was, what's, what, 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 what was happening? Because it just worked. And that's what technology needs to do. It needs to be completely imperceptible to the operator that is actually getting on with the job and, and putting the results out that we need. Well, uh, conveniently, you've said about the chopper. Let's go and have a look. Let's kind of look. So this chopper is a completely different unit to the one that we've got on the existing CR1090. A lot of changes. Two rather big lumps are missing. We used to have a belt that used to help the, the straw flow out of the back of the machine. That's gone. We used to have a chaff spreader down the bottom. That's gone. The good thing there is that with those two units missing, we save weight, but also we save power. So what we do here is we've moved the chopper. The old chopper would roughly be at this height. We've moved him up to where the rotor is up at the top here. We so refer so that this, this, this guard that I can see here, yep. this is this gearbox assembly. That's the back end of your chopper rotors. That's where the chopper so, rotor so is. Okay, and where, they're sitting where, where, a lot, where lot closer doing. to the back of the, the, your thrashing rotors. Completely. Yes, exactly, okay. exactly that. It gives us a little bit of an advantage, particularly when we get rid of that belt at the back in that we can slow the chopper down and then if we're swathing the straw out the back we can pass the straw over the top of a slow moving chopper. So that's conveniently brought me on to another point. So to begin with your, your chopper is, so is this hydraulic drive or belt drive the chopper now? It's belt drive. Okay, so, belt, okay. so a lot of these users are going to be thinking about um, chopping all their straw. Yes. That's fairly standard. When you're talking about headers of 50 foot, 60 foot, mm -hmm. there will be people who are bailing behind that. Yes. Straw has, in certainly yes. parts of the UK, particularly Dorset, I guess it's tested, yes. straw has a huge value. Anyone that's had to do bailing behind a very, very big combine with rotaries on it. Yeah. Um, um, want to hit you extensively with sticks. So what's, what have you done with this machine to allow effectively a 50 foot cut rotary to produce a swath which actually maintains straw quality? We've always, it's, it's the way that the twin rotor system works. It doesn't work in the same way that a conventional combine works by using key steel and grinding everything up. We basically have a nice big gap in there and what we do is we rub the, the grain against the grain. We need straw in the machine so that we can get this gentle threshing action. And by doing that, we can keep the straw at the back of the machine um, in line with where people are with the straw walker machine. In, in many cases, better. Uh, to, be, to be able to do that. Because you say you're relying on that crop and crop thrashing. Exactly. So in a, in a cereal crop, when yes. we've got you know, some, some oats with lots, lots of straw going through it, yeah. that's fine. When we go to something like linseed, yes. where we've got effectively quite a low crop on crop thrashing, yes. what, are, what adjustments are you making to the thrashing system okay. to account for that lack of effectively material in the thrashing okay. system? So what, so what we can do is we can change the, the rotor speed so we can, we can speed up and down, that makes the threshing more aggressive. We can change the concave clearance at the front of the machine. Again, that makes it more, more aggressive. On the go, we can change rotor veins on top of the rotor, so we can retain that crop, that crop volume within the rotor for longer. And all of these units will enable us to be able to, 
um, thrash difficult crops like linseed or uh, any, any anything else like that, which is a bit more specific. So, in terms of in terms of the machine length, because you said you got the rotors now longer. Yep. How many revolutions of crop are we typically seeing in one? In we, one? we we can vary it. So, with these rotor vanes at the top, we can vary it from probably five to a little bit over seven. So, uh, it, it it does alter by what the machine feels it needs. If it sees losses out the back, it will change the veins and it will keep the crop in the rotor longer, subject to the centrifugal force. Right, okay. Now, something you pointed out earlier, this that white, little white panel, white panel here, which it, is presumably it, it used to, not Wi-Fi. It, it, it used to be black and everyone missed it. So this little white panel, what it is, it's a radar system. So the combine itself is monitoring how far the chopped straw is traveling. The reason we use radar rather than light or infrared or anything like that is the dust at the back of the machine. The radar picks up the, 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 the particles of straw coming out the back. So what we can do there is the combine will constantly monitor it. If there's a crosswind or anything that affects the spread pattern, it will sort it out. With many people now looking to go to min till or zero till, what we can't afford to do with the back of this machine is, is cock up the spread pattern coming out the back. So your, your spread pattern will adjust Initially, you'll be targeting your full header width. Yes. So can we deliver 25 foot either side? Um, we can deliver a little bit over 25 foot uh, right, each, okay. each side. We've got this machine currently tested with an 18 metre, uh, so that's a 61 foot header, um, and that's currently being tested at the moment. Uh, and with it, it's, it's performing very well. And then you're saying as you work across slopes with different crosswinds, you'll, are you using mechanical veins in there or are you speeding up They're and slowing down the... Both. So, okay. so, so we've got a mechanical vein that's working at the back of the machine and we've also got independent control of the rotors so that we can speed up and slow down to be able to, uh, to, to hit the targets that we need to hit. Okay, so something which is above us and folds around on the yep. back is the unloading organ. Now I know there's been some quite interesting figures given on the, the capacities of this organ. Yes. Now I believe it's the biggest unloading unlo unlo organ that's ever been fitted to a combine, is that um, right? I will take your word for that. Okay. It's, it's it's pretty it's pretty damn quick. I'll tell yeah. I'll, I'll tell you that. So in terms um, of capacities, where are we looking on on unloading capacity on this? This machine? is this is running. The figure that we give is 210 liters per second. So you don't want to mess with the trailer. No, I mean just we we'll we'll look at it slightly later. But <clears throat> in terms of just the body for the output for that auger is huge. And yes, you're quite right. A, uh, a harvest miss. student slightly off ball will end up with yeah, um, a bit of shoveling to do. Yes, yes, as they should. Uh, thank you, Nigel. I think that's all we've got time for.